Hey, I'm Jen Wong, and this is Day Drinking. I hope you don't think you got nothing to say. Let the romance take you all where it may. There's only one song that the neighbor's gonna hear. Free music, free beer. Today, my guest is Jason Horn from Few Distillery in Evanston, Illinois. And he's here in this lovely garden because they have a breakfast gin. That's right, we do. <laughs> uh, it's our newest product. It's made with Earl Grey tea, juniper, and lemon. It's for brunch cocktails. Very appropriate for the setting. Well, tell us a little bit about Few. Most people know Few as a distillery that makes whiskey. That's right, yeah. We make a bourbon and a rye and a single malt. Uh, we're pretty well known for those. Those have won a bunch of awards, but uh, our very first product actually was a gin. Oh, um, I didn't know that. The whiskey takes years to age and gin doesn't. So you can sell gin the day you open your distillery. Right. Um, but yeah, we've, we've been making gin uh, the whole time we've been around and uh, we now have four, four different gins that we sell. So. Uh, we're also a gin distillery. So Few Spirits, uh, we are a craft distillery in Evanston. Uh, the backstory to Evanston is that it's been a, a big part of the Prohibition movement. So it was founded as a dry town. Um, it was actually dry all through Prohibition, all the way up until the 1970s. Wow, the 1970s. Yeah, uh, still to this day, there are no bars in Evanston. You have to serve food in order to serve alcohol or be a hotel. So, so there is no... a distillery in Evanston, but there isn't a bar. That's correct, yes. Like a, a, a legitimate where you just come in and drink Where you drink can only alcohol. drink. Yeah. Right. There are restaurants right. that, serve, that alcohol, serve alcohol, but there are no bars. That's yeah, that's right. Um, our master distiller had to sort of work with the city council um, when the distillery started in 2011 and figure out all the permitting, all the everything. It was the first alcohol production facility wow. of any kind in the city of Evanston, legal production facility of any kind in the city of Evanston. Um, <laughs> right, and, I'm sure uh, there are a couple backyard I, gin places I don't, maybe. I don't know, I don't, it's, I'm not sure about that. I mean, it is the home of Northwestern University, so maybe some students may have fooled around with uh, with some, some brewing or some illegal distilling at some point. Um, <laughs> but this is a legal This distillery. is a fully 100% legal 100 distillery. Like uh, legal. Yeah, so our master distiller, Paul Haletko, worked with the city council to figure out all the permitting, all of everything. The city was surprisingly uh, very much behind us. And uh, since we opened, uh, at least two breweries that I know of have opened in Evanston. So we sort of laid the groundwork for nice. uh, turning this formerly dry town into a, a, a booze mecca. <laughs> um, That's what we like I'm to sorry, hear. I'm sorry, City Fathers of Evanston, <laughs> Illinois. Uh, He's making it a better place. That's right. He's making it a better place. But uh, the reason, part of the reason that we're called Few, um, we're a small distillery. We don't make a lot. We make a few. Uh, we like puns. If you're only going to have one, make it a few. Uh, but the, the other reason is Evanston uh, was and still is the headquarters of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Which still? Was a, it does still exist as far as I know. It's not terribly active. Uh, but back, it was founded in the, the 1800s, you know, they fought for both women's suffrage, a uh, good thing, and... Um, we like that. And, and prohibition, which is not such a good thing. Women but, voting, uh, this is a good thing. Yes. Get out there and vote. Very important. <laughs> Let's bring politics into this show. <laughs> right. um, but so a, a, I didn't say who for, I just said yes. you should vote. Yes. <laughs> uh, a, a longtime president of the Women's Christian Temperance Union uh, who lived in Evanston. There's a lot of things named after her in Evanston. Uh, she was, at the time, the most famous woman in the world. She spoke at the Chicago World's Fair of 1893. She's very, very famous. There's a statue of her in the U.S. Capitol. Uh, her name was Frances Elizabeth Willard. So we put her initials uh, on our bottles as a little bit of a middle finger to, to the temperance movement. To the temperance yeah. movement. Yeah. yeah, my brother went to Northwestern and they would have a party every year that was in her honor. Well, yeah. the, the funny thing is Northwestern actually predates the city of Evanston. So they founded the city of Evanston after the university was there. And I, I guess the, the rationale behind banning alcohol was, you know, to make sure the students had a wholesome experience while they were in college. Oh, it's for the students. Yeah, of course. <laughs> of course. Well, let's try this breakfast gin. All right. So breakfast gin, um, basically in order to make gin, all that's legally required is juniper. It has, to, it has to be alcohol, it has to be flavored like juniper. Beyond that, you can do whatever the heck you want. You can add anything else, you can use different types of alcohol bases. Um, so with the breakfast gin, um, basically we wanted a lot of citrus and a lot of floral, which is 
what's good in a brunch cocktail like a French 75, Ramos Gin Fizz, something like that. So we used Earl Grey tea, which is a very floral type of tea. It's also got bergamot peel in it, so there's some extra citrus. Um, we used lemon peel for some nice kind of sharp citrus. Oh, it's so citrusy. Mm -hmm. This would be great in a gin and tonic too. Yes, it certainly would. And of course juniper. And uh, of course juniper. Because, because have they to have, have to have juniper. You have to have juniper, otherwise it's not gin, gin, otherwise it's just flavored vodka. Right. This is 84 proof because we decided it tasted best at 84 proof. Uh, and yeah, Because a lot of gins are 80, right? Yeah, many, many gins are 80. Uh, so the, actually all four of these gins, oddly enough, are different proofs. Mm. Uh, we have a Navy Strength gin, which is 114. Right, we'll our talk American about that gin in a is second. 80, and our Barrel gin is 93. So we just so play around So this is more the classic, the, the American gin. No, the, well, the, the standard issue gin is classic London dry. Right. The American gin is kind of a modern, um, a modern, more modern gin. Um, and this the is the age. super modern gin. Yeah, this is, this is sort of, Quite different, but it, there's actually, you know, it, it, it really fits in well with sort of the history of gin because gin's always been used in sort of these lighter cocktails. It's always been very popular in morning cocktails. The original cocktail, which we call the old-fashioned now, was to be drunk in the morning to like wake you up to get you going in the morning. So there's a right. long, long history of drinking uh, with breakfast. Well, you know what they say: if you don't start drinking by noon, you can't drink all day. This is true. <laughs> And the only way to start drinking before noon is with breakfast gin. Is with gin. breakfast gin. Hence the teacups. I just thought it would be mm -hmm. a great way to taste breakfast gin with teacups. <laughs> Few is in 20-something uh, states, breakfast gin. Uh, we launched it in the Chicago area last summer, uh, and it's now rolling out. Uh, it's in seven states, Washington, D.C., and the U.K. currently. Uh, it'll be rolling out it's to so some more of our states soon. Yeah, you can order it online. It was, it was originally kind of a special edition, you know, this, a special gin. One of the assistant distillers actually came up with the idea for it. So Paul kind of let him make a batch, liked it. We put it out. We, we did a big a big event at the distillery last summer to kind of launch it, put it out in the Chicago area. It did so well that now we're, we're making it into a main one of our main products. I love it. I'm so glad we can partake of it here in California and in the rest of the states. Absolutely. Cheers. Cheers. So um, next up, we've got a few standard issue gin. Uh, so this is a Navy very strength. traditional in a lot of ways. Yeah, it's Navy strength. Uh, it's a London dry gin. So gin originates in Holland. Uh, it started off as Geneva, which is very malty, essentially a flavored whiskey. Mm -hmm. uh, and with then, juniper. With juniper and, and other things. And other, other things, Other right. medicinal botanicals. Mm -hmm. uh, they all have, you know, because various healing powers. Because alcohol is medicine after right. all. That's right, exactly. But uh, the, so, so gin came over from Holland to England, caught on, British went nuts for it, and uh, they developed London dry gin, which is kind of, for a while, was pretty much the only style you could get. And now we have so the many, gym. they're the modern style. You have the old Tom that's come back. Right. You have the Genevers that are everywhere mm -hmm. also, as well as a number of like modern styled right. gins. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Gin's so it's really, very exciting it's as a, a, as a big, category. Big renaissance in the last few years. But to completely go against that whole renaissance, we made a very traditional <laughs> London dry gin. Um, so but it is rare, like it had been rare in the market to see a Navy Strength gin. That's that, true. Like, especially as an American Navy Strength gin. Yes. Like oftentimes you would see a Navy Strength gin that came out of London or came out of Europe, mm -hmm. like European ones. Mm -hmm. But a, an American Navy Strength gin you don't see as often. That is true. I think. That is very true. Uh, yeah, the fun thing with Navy Strength is the, the history behind it. Um, yeah, so tell us why it's called yeah, Navy so Strength. Navy Strength. Because I know, but you guys want to know, That's right? That's right. You will want to know once you hear the story. <laughs> um, so Navy Strength means 57. Because it involves fire. That's right. Uh, <laughs> Navy Strength Navy Strength means 57% alcohol, 114 proof. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, sailors in the British Navy were given uh, a daily ration of alcohol. Uh, originally it was rum, later it became gin as gin became popular in the UK. But uh, if you're going to be carrying alcohol on your boat, or your ship, I'm sorry. Ship! And your boat, and your little <laughs> boaty McBoat face. <laughs> so if you're gonna be carrying alcohol aboard your ship, uh, you're gonna be probably spilling that alcohol. And if you're an old timey naval sailing vessel, uh, you're also gonna be carrying gunpowder. And if you spill the alcohol on the gunpowder and it's lower proof, uh, it ruins the gunpowder, it won't ignite anymore. So 57% alcohol and then is it's the point. Useless. And then it's useless and you can't shoot your and cannons you can't at shoot the damn Spanish. 
Uh, for their exactly. doubloons! Right. Or at Napoleon or whoever. Or whoever it might be. <laughs> so Especially if you're the British Navy and that's, you know, right. you're hardcore. Right. So 57% is the point at which uh, the gunpowder will still ignite if you accidentally spill your, your gin or rum or whatever uh, onto the gunpowder. So this is very important. This is very right? important, historically, uh, incredibly important to the history of the world. But um, then you also get really high proof gin, which stands up really well in cocktails right. because it doesn't get watered down as much, the dilution doesn't affect as much, and you, and you still get all of that alcohol. Right. So few standard issue is great for something like a Negroni, uh, any, anything where you've got other very strongly flavored ingredients in there. So if you're mixing it with Campari, Chartreuse, you know, any, anything where you're worried that the other stuff is going to overpower the gin, uh, higher proof gin is going to come through more. And stand up to those other strong exactly. ingredients. Exactly. Great. So uh, London Dry Gin, uh, the big things there, Juniper, obviously. Well, let's pour a little and then yeah. we can talk about it a little bit more. It's powerful still. Uh, 114, I would right. imagine so. Oh, I get all the juniper on the nose. Yeah. So that's the big characteristic of London Dry Gin, is it's heavy, heavy on the juniper. Um, there's also typically a lot of citrus. So in ours, it's juniper, there's lemon, uh, there's some other citrus, but there's also fennel. A little hint of fennel. It doesn't really taste like licorice. It's kind of this back note. Mm, it earthy, does give it a, a savory bit. quality. Yeah, so it adds something to it, but if you're a person who hates licorice, No, it doesn't taste, taste like licorice. It doesn't have that licorice flavor. It just mm -hmm. it just actually adds more of just a savory exactly. note to it. Exactly. Yeah. So this is, you know, it's great in a gin and tonic. It's great in a Negroni, anything like that. Pinkies up. I'm like, how do I? Can't do it in Proper this cup. Proper British way. Way. Cheers. Cheers. Oh, and the other thing I should mention about few standard issue. So uh, all of our labels uh, of of all of our bottles are images from the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago, uh, which is a very big deal for the city of Chicago. It was kind of their rebirth on the scene after the Great Chicago Fire destroyed most of the city, um, and so there were a lot of sort of modern technological achievements uh, that made their debuts there. I believe the ice cream cone was invented there, um, the, the first Ferris wheel was there. Oh, and that's on Pin the American gin bottle. Gin bottle. Uh, one of the whiskey bottles has the first ever electrically powered fountain. So there are all these technological marvels, sort of the beginning of what the modern era. What would we do era. if we didn't have these exactly. inventions? But on, on for standard issue, very appropriately, we have this, this naval vessel. Uh, it was actually a British ship that sailed all uh, along the St. Lawrence and docked in Lake Michigan for, for the, the World's of the, Fair. For the World's Fair, so people could come oh. and see this modern battleship. And Francis spoke at the World's Fair too. Yes, Francis she? Elizabeth Willard spoke there. Uh, a lot of people spoke there. It was on for something like a quarter or a fifth of America's America's population at the time visited this fair. It was open wow. for kind of one summer. Yeah, I mean, crazy. Like it's it crazy. was the biggest thing in the world. So it's an iconic thing for Chicago. Uh, so that's, you know, we put it on our labels as a, you know, a shout out to to our hometown. So it kind of comes all full circle. Exactly. That's great. Yeah. I love all the details. It just brings it all together. And it, and it makes it so personal to the distillery and to this brand, mm -hmm. really. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so now we've got a few American gin. So uh, the other three gins, the, the base spirit for those is a just neutral alcohol. Um, we, we distill it ourselves at the distillery, but mm -hmm. it's distilled at high proof. It's not designed to have any real flavor, it's just alcohol. The American gin, this starts off as a bourbon. Thank you. Um, Okay, so it's essentially, it's an oh. unaged whiskey. It's actually a weeded bourbon. Um, the bourbon that we make is a different mash bill than the bourbon mash bill that goes into the American gin. So you have to make, you make one specifically for the gin and then you do one for the bourbon that you make. Yes. Wow. Yes, I'm not sure why, but. Because it was Paul, better? Paul is a wise man and makes delicious stuff. So I'll, I'll let him do that. If it came off the still and we put it in barrels, it would be bourbon. Instead, we infuse it with botanicals and redistill it and it becomes gin. What that does is you get a lot of those grain notes that kind of like a little bit sweet kind of musty uh if you've ever been like a in a in a feed store with like bins of, mm. of corn that you feed to cattle it's got like a little a bit of that yeah maltiness note. right a little bit of grain um and so to that we we add juniper of course because we need mm -hmm. juniper to make gin uh some some other traditional botanicals there's coriander there's some citrus uh, but there's also a couple of unusual things, vanilla beans. So we use oh. whole vanilla beans. Uh, we actually source them. Um, it also, I think, gives it a creamy mouthfeel, the 
Do you think that's because that's the, of the, the whiskey? The whiskey, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, because basically what, what gives whiskey flavor is all the stuff in it that is not alcohol. Right. Um, and so the higher proof you distill at, the more pure the alcohol is, the less flavor you're getting. Mm -hmm. So that vodka should not taste like anything because vodka is distilled at very, very high proof. So this, this is distilled at lower proof, so you get more of the, the grain flavors, the flavors that come from the corn and the wheat and the, the barley that we use to make it. It's very distinct. Definitely. Well, so the, the two kind of different botanicals, the things that, besides the, the, the whiskey base, uh, the things that make it uh, unique are that we use vanilla beans, whole vanilla beans that we source direct from the grower in Madagascar. Paul, our distiller, has a friend who did Peace Corps in Madagascar. So we have a connection directly to the vanilla plantation. We buy the vanilla direct, which is pretty cool. Wow. Uh, and then Cascade hops that we grow at the distillery. Oh. Um, yeah, the climate in, uh, in Chicago is actually very well suited to growing hops. So we have some hop vines. Um, Do you have other things that you grow? nearby i mean so few is known as a like grain to glass yeah we're, we're a grain to glass distillery so we make everything from scratch we also source all of the grain uh, from within about 150 miles of the distillery which you know we are in the midwest where it's the grain belt it's where all of the grain is grown um right but you know we, we do take care to make sure that it, it's local um, with our botanicals and the other ingredients you know we try to source it from nearby to the distillery if possible. Obviously things like vanilla, vanilla right. doesn't grow anywhere near Chicago. Right. Um, so in those cases we try to source it you know as close to the, the source as we can. Sure. Paul likes to say that, that we, we make in a week what Jack Daniel spills on the floor every day. Right. This is craft distilling. Yeah. The, so the American gin, uh, it's our lowest proof of, of the four gins. It's only 80 proof and it's fairly Which is consistent gentle. with with most gins. Yeah, so well, gin, so distilled spirits in general in the U.S. have to be at least 80 proof. Um, so most most gins are because basically the, the lower the proof the more water you're selling to people. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but exactly. Uh, this one, you know, it's it's fairly gentle. Uh, you know, we want those kind of grain notes to come through, so it's pretty easy on the juniper. So it starts off lower, and then, of course, we dilute it down to 80 when we bottle it. Right, um, which is how you get all the flavor, and you can taste all of those. Botanic. Yeah, yeah in, in the American gin, the, the whiskey base, it's distilled at, I think, about a 140 proof or so. Uh, versus the, the other ones, the, the neutral alcohol base is distilled at about 180 proof. So much higher concentration of alcohol. Um, and so alcohol and water pull the different flavors out of the different botanicals in, in different ways. Like certain things dissolve better in alcohol than water, certain things dissolve better in water than alcohol. So as you play with the proof, it changes the flavors that... That, that are more prominent on the nose, exactly. that are more prominent right. when you're Well, and that's why it in. breakfast gin, for example, it's 84 proof. It's only, it's 2% higher alcohol than the American gin, but it... Makes a difference. It makes a difference, and that's why we bottle it at 84, because it tastes better. The standard issue in the American gin both have a very savory quality to it. Part of it, I think, is the, is the fact that it's a whiskey base, because mm -hmm. it has a chewiness mm -hmm. to it. You know, yeah, like a has, creaminess, it has a chewiness, more, more like feel. a. It's not just sort of gone after you swallow it. It lingers a little bit. Right. Um, but it's still fairly gentle. So this one, if you're mixing it, you know, it's you don't want to mix it in a Negroni, for example, because the Campari will just sort of wash it away. You want lighter anything, anything that has, you know, champagne or or club soda, and it's great. Anything with citrus goes really well with lime, with grapefruit, things like that. Yeah, it's subtle and beautiful. It's like a very delicate, yeah. delicate gin. Much more delicate than the, the 114 proof monster we just tasted. No, but that's, there's a time and a place for that. Mm -hmm. And it's really nice because it does stand up in cocktails or stand yeah. up in a drink. Absolutely. And then similarly with the breakfast gin, it has a bold flavor and a very strong citrus note to it mm -hmm. that I think would cut through mm -hmm. in a cocktail as yeah, well. Definitely. You know, and especially if you want that kind of note, if you want the citrus notes or you want, right. you know, a, a, a bold, a bolder flavor. Yeah. Well, and that's, yeah, I mean, I think it says a lot that, you know, so that we have such a wide range of flavors all in the same category of gin. Gin is really, it gives you the most freedom of, of all the different categories of alcohol. You can do whatever the hell you want, as long as you put juniper in it. Right. So, you know, there's actually, there's a mezcal based gin out there. Yes. You know, people do all kinds of crazy stuff and it's all, it's fine. It's mm -hmm. like the most experimental uh, I part love of that. the spirits field. I find it very, very <laughs> interesting. And also that the, that the category is growing. I mean, you as a distillery have four. 
right. you know, and um, in the market, there's many, many more gins than there mm -hmm. ever were. Mm -hmm. Like it used to be, it was just like Beef Eater was what people knew, or Tanqueray maybe, right. like that. And they were all imported. They, you were, know? All they were all imported. They were all London imported. Dry. They were all London Dry. Right. right. That's why everybody thinks that gin tastes like you know a Christmas tree or grandma's house or you know whatever people say about gin. Right. It's because the that only gins style. they've had are those really juniper heavy. And so if you don't like juniper very much, you didn't used to like gin. <laughs> right. Yeah. But this one even the ju the juniper is very subtle in oh, this definitely. one. I mean, the yeah. London Dry style, like the navy strength, is definitely a juniper yeah. heavy. Yeah, you have to like, like juniper to, for, yeah. to go for standard issues. Absolutely. But yeah, American Which I do. gin, I love um, our barrel gin for sure, even the breakfast gin, you know, the juniper is less prominent. Mm -hmm. It's very subtle, mm -hmm. but works really well in, in bringing it all together, I think. Mm -hmm. All right, so we started with breakfast, and now we're going to end with dinner. Yes. So this is, I guess, the closest thing we have to an after dinner gin. <laughs> uh, this is few barrel gin. Uh, and obviously you can see it's a different color than all of the other gins. So this gin ages in a combination of our used uh, bourbon and rye barrels, as well as new oak Thank barrels. Um, so this is, you know, barrel aged gin is sort of a, it's a category that's getting a lot of attention lately. A lot of new ones are coming out, uh, but it's actually, there's a lot of historical precedent for it. Barrels used to be the way that you shipped everything. Like it was the shipping container of its day. For that's shipping. how bourbon started to be yeah, bourbon. Yeah, that's actually, how bourbon right? started because it was put in a barrel to take it from Kentucky where it was being made to wherever it was being sold. It's Otherwise, a, it's just moonshine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, same deal with, with barrel aged gin. You know, if you were making gin in Holland and shipping it to London, it would go in a barrel. So, it would pick up some color, it would pick up some flavor. So, um, yeah, so the, the botanicals in barrel gin, you know, we, we picked botanicals that would go well with. The, the flavors that come from the barrel, the oak, the vanilla mm -hmm. uh, notes that you get. So it, we ease up on the juniper, um, there's pepper, there's a little bit of fennel in this one, and it it's, comes out, basically you end up with something that's sort of halfway between a whiskey and a gin. It gets a lot of the sort of mouthfeel and the, the flavor notes of, a, of an aged whiskey, but you of course also have the gin botanicals in there. Is this also the neutral grain? Mm -hmm. yeah, so this is also a, a neutral base spirit, it's not um, it's not actually the, the whiskey base that we use for the American gin. So you, mm. you don't really get grainy notes, but you do get those vanilla and oak notes that you get from, from a whiskey. Yeah, you definitely do. But the mouthfeel is really different. It has mm -hmm. that same, uh, like astringent quality that gin has. Mm -hmm. But, so the finish, but then you have a little of that lingering, um, like wood notes that right. a whiskey has. So that exactly. is, yeah. yeah. So it's, I say it's a, it's a whiskey for gin lovers or gin for whiskey lovers. The the cool thing about barrel gin is um, you can use it in traditional whiskey cocktails. So it makes an awesome old fashioned. Um, it makes a great Manhattan. Uh, if you're somebody who drinks Manhattans or you know somebody who drinks Manhattans, make them a, a barrel gin Manhattan and don't tell them there's gin in it. Uh, they'll know something's different, right. but you, you'd never be able to pick out that there was gin in that cocktail. Right. Um, How so, interesting. Yeah. Things like the you know Negroni Boulevardier, um, Martinez is one of my favorite cocktails. With I love this. a Martinez. It's very nice. Which is a traditional gin cocktail, but right. with the vermouth, it becomes it's similar to a Manhattan almost. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's it's sweet vermouth and then maraschino, so it's basically an improved Manhattan with gin. Right. Oh, I can see that being lovely with this. Mm -hmm. There is so much. The vanilla is so much on the nose. Like. But then I, it goes away. As but you then get, it goes away mm -hmm. as you. You get vanilla on the nose, on the. When you first taste it, it's definitely gin. Yeah. You can smell the juniper on the nose. Mm -hmm. Then kind of after you swallow the, the finish is very whiskey-like. The botanicals go away and you're just left with that. The wood. Vanilla, the oak, the wood. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. But it is interesting because it is the neutral spirit and not like, so in a whiskey you would have like the grain that you would be left with too. So right. you have the grain and the wood. Right. And so this one's so interesting because it is the finish is a gin finish, but then you're left with wood, which right. is like, oh, that's really different and mm -hmm. interesting. It's interesting that this is such an old style in a way and is, you know, a traditional way that gin had been served in the past, but has been lost in so many ways. Right. Like, it feels like such a new category these days because you're only now seeing a couple barrel-aged gins on the market. It's yeah. such a niche 
yeah. category well, or point, niche like I mean, product. When ours came out, there were probably, we were not the first. I mean, we didn't invent this category. We don't claim to have invented this category. But, you know, there were maybe five or six on the market when it first came out. And now, today, there are at least a dozen, if not more. Yeah. It's definitely a category that distillers are, are kind of figuring out and, uh, and playing around with. Yeah, I, I love it because it really opens up what you can make in cocktails. And I love cocktails that play with your perception. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those spirits that really plays with your perception yeah, because absolutely. in your head, you see brown, you, you, and see you, brown, think. you think that it's going to be mm -hmm. um, a whiskey right. of some sort. Yeah. And then it has all those botanicals that you associate with gin. And, exactly. and then your head has to go, ah, oh, that's... <laughs> Yeah, so, I don't know yeah, what to do with that. It's a mind fuck in a bottle. Yes, um, totally. But it's also delicious. It is. And it's delicious. Mm -hmm. And it is like a, a really nice after dinner drink. Like this feels like breakfast and it feels like you can move through the day. You yeah. have a different gin for every hour of the day. That's right. That's, that's exactly <laughs> right. But the, yeah, I mean the barrel gin, you know, you can, if, if you really enjoy it, you can sip it neat. You can, you know, put it on the rocks. Um, you can make it in an old-fashioned, you know, a very, very dry, old-fashioned, with just, you know, a tiny bit of sugar and some bitters. So it's, yeah, it's very versatile in that way. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining me thank here. You. Thank in you. for having the me garden. in the garden. <laughs> for spring. That's right. And sharing few gins with us. This is Jason Horn. You can find few gins in your local liquor stores, or is there a website they yes. can visit? Yes, our website is fewspirits.com. Um, Pretty easy to find. We have lists, you know, lists online of where you can find everything, uh, and uh, yeah, you can buy all of our stuff online from several different sources. Excellent. Well, I'm Jen Wong. Thank you for day drinking with us. Please leave a comment if you like the show and subscribe. Cheers. Mm -hmm.